I don't need to know. <laughs> Imagine the disappointment of some of the folks you might be related to. Hey, it could be good, it could be bad. Ancestry, right? We're going to look at Jesus' ancestry this morning. I've entitled the sermon as such, Our Savior's Sovereign Line. Verses 1 through 17, chapter 1 of Matthew. I'm going to read through all these names. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Aminadab, Aminadab begot Nashon, Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, and Obed begot Jesse. Jesse begot David the king. David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. And Solomon begot Rehoboam. And Rehoboam begot Abijah. And Abijah begot Asa. Asa begot Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat begot Joram. And Joram begot Uzziah. Uzziah begot Jotham. And Jotham begot Ahaz. And Ahaz begot Hezekiah. Hezekiah begot Manasseh, and Manasseh begot Amon, and Amon begot Josiah. Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot uh, Shealtiel, and Shealtiel begot Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel begot Abiud, and Abiud begot Eliakim, and Eliakim begot Azor. And Azor begot Zadok, and Zadok begot Achim. And Achim begot Eliad. Eliad begot Eleazar, and Eleazar begot Matehan, and Matehan begot Jacob. And Jacob begot Joseph, finally some regular names, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the captivity of Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity of Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. Father, your word tells us that all scripture is profitable. Lord, I believe this is too. Lord, I pray that between all the begots, we get it today. Lord, thank you for your word, and I pray that you would, uh, by your spirit today, Lord, just light our hearts with it. Father, let us learn from you through the ancestry of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. No, I'm not going through all 17 verses, but I just want to highlight a few for you this morning. Yeah, I'm close to coming out of this coat already. Highlight a few things. How many of you, how many of you would say, I have read through the genealogy of Jesus before? How many of you say, I read through it as fast as possible, messed up most of the names, and just kept right on going, right? Listen, there are good things about our Savior to be learned even from this ancestry. And some of it is just so exciting. When the Lord showed it to me, I mean, it was just like, wow, thank you for showing me that. The first thing we want to see is the preeminent in the ancestry. The preeminent in the ancestry. Verse 1 Jesus Christ. Let me say something to you this morning. Anytime Jesus appears in your family tree, he becomes preeminent. Did y'all get that? Matter of fact, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Jesus is not just in the family tree, he is the family tree. Amen? If you are, if you are anything but a branch of Christ, you are in the wrong family, I promise you. It doesn't matter what your last name is. We all, we all are here this morning celebrating the fact, and I hope that you can celebrate the fact, that you are a part of the body of Christ. And so Matthew immediately just places him front and center, preeminent in the ancestry. Matthew's purpose, now that they're different, if you go over to Luke, it's different than Matthew, but his purpose here is in the genealogy is to show Jesus as the true Messiah. 
the king of the Jews. He is the rightful heir to the throne. That's why Matthew traces his line through David. Okay? We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. His name is also the first name mentioned in the New Testament, placing him as a central figure as he should be. Matthew sets the precedent here. God, God sovereignly by his spirit inspired Matthew to write such. Jesus, the first name in the New Testament, the season of grace and Christ is central in that entire theme. And so I don't want you to skip over the fact that Christ is the preeminent in the ancestry. But I also want you to notice a few things, and I didn't go into all these. There are more than these. I just want to point a few things out about the providence in the ancestry. There were some things here that had to be overcome for all this to fall into place as it should be. The first you'll notice down around verse 11, verse 12, the Babylonian captivity. The Babylonian captivity says Josiah begot uh, Jeconiah and his brothers about the time they were carried away and then after they were brought to Babylon. So listen to me. The line of Christ persevered no matter what was going on around him. What we can learn from that is there's no foe or no enemy that can erase the plans of God. Do you know there are people in your life that if they had their way, they would love to undo the things that God has promised you, but they can't? Now, they can make you lose your, cu your cool, right? They can make you damage your testimony. But not one person in your life, not one power, not one principality, not anything can come against you that can undo what God's already done in your life. What God has done is, is fixed for you. And so first, there was the providence over the Babylonian captivity. Then I want you to notice the name in verse 12. That name is Jeconiah. In Jeremiah 22.30, this is what God said about him. He was an evil king. Thus saith the Lord, write this man down as childless, a man who shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper, sitting on the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. God placed a curse upon him. The curse would have disqualified Jesus but God had a plan. Do y'all know God always has a plan? You know what, what the Lord blessed me with as I was studying that? And I thought, here's the guy who, who just was cursed and he's in the line. Listen, y'all know every one of us had a curse on us? Y'all realize that? One man sinned and by him sin entered the world. Every single one of us were born under a curse. And God redeemed us. He overcame the curse. And every single one of us here today, every single one of us have had a curse, if we're a child of God today, have had a curse overcome in our lives. Some of you just in your own natural family have, have had such a difficult background, but God sovereignly has overcome all those things in your life and he's brought you to a brand new place. Don't miss that name, Jeconiah. What did God do? We come down to Joseph, who was in the line of Jeconiah. And you'll notice the word that's not next to Joseph's name. There's no begot. You see, the way God circumvented that through his sovereign providence, providence was he said, you shall not begot anybody. You shall only marry somebody. And he married Mary, right? Says Joseph, the husband of Mary, right? The begotting was by the Holy Spirit. Right? Now, I want to say something to you. That's the way, that's the way God circumvented the entire curse of man through, on the person of Christ. There was no man as his father. It was the Holy Spirit as his father. So I just want you to see the providence of God at work even in his own ancestry. Now, I want to talk about Mary for just a moment because Mary is... is Mary is so misunderstood. Listen, Mary, according to Luke, is called the blessed one, right? You know what that literally means? One that grace is endued upon. Mary was a lady who, by all accounts of Scripture, was a righteous lady. She was a faithful lady. 
and God moved upon her in a a miraculous way. But I want to say something to you. Mary is not to be worshipped. Mary is a woman that God sovereignly moved upon to birth his child through. That's it. God is provident providence is seen all throughout all throughout his ancestry. I want you to notice the promised in the ancestry. The promised in the ancestry. Go back to verse 1. Notice something strange here. He's called the son of two men, the son of David and the son of Abraham. The son of David and the son of Abraham. Why are those two men listed so prominently in the first verse? Well, I already told you, Matthew is trying to trace the line through David, right? But why those two men? Because both of those men had promises made to them by God himself as to the coming of Jesus Christ. Matthew, I mean, Genesis 12, 2 and 3 says this. This is the Abrahamic covenant. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you, uh, uh, curse him who curses you, and you, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, how else could all the families of the earth be blessed than, than the person of Jesus Christ come through your line? So God had made that promise to Abraham, and here we see the fruition. The person of Jesus Christ was the very fruit of of that promise. Then what did he say to David? Uh, we'll read the Psalm 132 11 here. It says, The Lord has sworn in truth to David, he will not turn from it. I will set upon your throne the fruit of your body. If you notice in verse 6, in verse 6, it says this twice David the king. David the king. There are at least 15 kings listed in this genealogy. At least 15, but David is the only one that's referenced as David the king. Because God made a promise to David that it would be his fruit that sat upon the throne forever. Now what's my point of bringing that out? Because listen, you sit here this morning as the promised of God. John John took a minute while ago to ask you, what are we thankful for today? What are we grateful for? Listen, I I don't know if you know how many promises God has made to you in his word. Three, four, at least. When's the last time you got in the word and said, Father, give me a promise that I can stand on? Give Give me a promise that I can hold fast to when the enemy's assaulting me, when things aren't going my way. I want a promise that I can cling to and say there's nobody that can remove this promise from me. Because I want to tell you, the Word says the promises of God are yes and amen. They are done. And so here Matthew lays these two men out. Listen, don't think again these two men receive these promises because of their perfection. I've reminded you, especially on, on Wednesday nights, those Old Testament saints, guess what? They were men and women just like we are. Abraham, I can think twice, John and I were talking about the other day, lied twice to, to pagan rulers, right, about his wife. Now, Abraham might have said to Sarah, I do this because I'm trying to protect you. No. Abraham had his own head on his mind when he said lie and tell him you're my sister right do we need to even talk about what David did these were not two perfect men that received promises of God they were flawed individuals just like we are and yet God stood by his promise I want to tell you today it's not your performance that makes God's promise good it's God's word that makes his promise good I am so glad the promises of God are not dependent on my performance. Aren't you glad of that this morning? I would have probably erased all of them for me personally because I can't behave well enough to receive one thing God's promised me. But Christ in me can. What about the people in the ancestry? Whew. 
I want to tell you, I don't do cartwheels. But if I could, I would have done one. How many of y'all would love to see your, your family line listed up here on the screen? Y'all know anybody in your family line that you might be like, oh, I don't know if I want you to know that or not. Any, anybody? Don't look around. Don't give it away, right? I have some of those people come. I didn't know you were related to... Mm. Yeah, I didn't want that to get out. Listen who's in Jesus' archaeology. I'm going to give you four names. And listen, women are not usually listed in, in genealogies. They're just not. I'm going to give you four ladies. Four ladies. First, in verse 3, Tamar. Tamar was an, a, a, a seductress and an adulterer. She played the harlot. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, here's what Judah said. Bring her out and we'll burn her. A woman that Judah saw fit for fire. And she's in verse 3 of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. God redeemed her. God redeemed her. Then right after her, we come to Rahab. Rahab didn't play the harlot. Rahab was the harlot. But she believed God. She believed God and he redeemed her. And now she finds her name. She finds her name in the ancestry of Jesus Christ. Next we come to Ruth. We come to Ruth who was Naomi's daughter-in-law, right? And, and she was a Moabite woman. And the Bible explicitly forbade any Israelite from marrying a Moab woman. Could not marry a Moabite woman. And her husband broke that law, broke that Levitical law and married her. Listen, and then we know how God sovereignly in the book of Ruth put the kinsman redeemer in play with Boaz after her husband had died. What a beautiful picture of our own redemption through Jesus Christ. And here was a Moabite woman now, redeemed by our Savior, and she finds herself a Moabite woman in the lineage, in the line of Jesus Christ. And the fourth lady was not even named by name. Just says, the one who was the wife of Uriah, Bathsheba. Bathsheba, of her own accord, did nothing wrong. David took advantage of her, saw her on the roof, called her to himself, used her, killed Uriah, and God took their offspring from them. But look, right after that, he blessed the two of them with Solomon, who would be king. Where's Bathsheba? Maybe not listed by name, but she's right there. Right there in the archaeology. No, ancestry of Jesus Christ. Four people. Listen, when I'm studying this, all of a sudden the Lord said, Look, there were flawed people in my line before I came, and there's flawed people in my line after I came. How many of you are glad that, that Christ allows flawed people in his family tree? Those of you who aren't don't realize how flawed you are. How can we not be excited because Jesus redeems the broken? Y'all get that? <laughs> Woo, I'm so glad flawed people can be in the family of God. We sing that little song, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Not because of anything we've done, but because of everything he's done. How in the world can it be 
that we can be in the family of God. How, how can Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and every single one of us sitting here today find ourselves in the family of God? I'm glad you asked, Titus 3, 4 through 7. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior toward man, appeared, y'all ain't ready for this. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. Not by anything we have done. But according to His mercy, He saved us. Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior that having been justified by His grace, here it is, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I will not move one step further. I will not say another word until you've heard this. Some of you are sitting right here this morning, right here this morning, and all you've ever heard your whole life is how flawed you are. That's all you've ever heard. That's it. You're nothing. You're this. You're that. You're less than. Praise God, Jesus Christ came and died for the less than. Because I want to tell you the truth. In the eyes of God, we're all less than. And you're sitting here this morning contemplating what it all means to be a part of the family of God. What does it mean to be a Christian what does it mean to be part of this ancestry? I want to tell you what it means. It means no performance. It means simply understanding that who you are is who you were born as. And no performance will remove it. No performance will erase it. Only the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And as we are washed by His Holy Spirit made clean immediately we become a part of the family of God it's not about baptism that's just going to be an outward symbol of an inward work that's not what saves us nothing happens down there when you come and talk to me listen I don't have any magic dust in my pockets there's nothing about me that matters all you do when you come down here and meet me is just share the news with me first and I get to share it with everybody else there's nothing, nothing that happens here nor there that saves you. It happens in your heart when you realize that you are flawed before God and Christ has redeemed you through His shed blood. I want you to be excited about that this morning because here's the truth of the matter. There are some people that tell you you have to be a certain way to be a Christian. Listen. When God saves you, He will make you who He wants you to be. He will work through you to do those things that need to be done. But there's nothing you have to do to be saved other than realize your need for, to be saved and then trust the one who can save. I'm glad God allows flawed people into His family because if not, no one would be in it. And He put them here in His Word prominently so that we can see and go hey guess what just like you they're flawed people but I love them and I redeemed them and now they're part of my family aren't you glad to be a part of the family of God amen, amen. I'm going to close now because we got a baptism to tend to the periods of the ancestry verse 17 Ooh, preacher, we're already at verse 17. Notice what he says. Three divisions here, 14 generations in each, right? One is, the first is the pre-monarchy era. The pre-monarchy era before there were any kings in the tribe of Israel, the nation of Israel, was the pre-monarchy, and it was the rise of Israel. God began to do a great work in the nation of Israel, and they were on the rise. Then the second 14 generations are the rule of Israel, the monarchy, when the people said, yeah, God's pretty good, but we need us one of them men kings. Whew. 
Y'all realize how much men kings have messed up? The nation of Israel found out pretty quick. But those second 14 generations are during the monarchy reign. So we had the pre-monarchy, the monarchy. We had the rise, we had the rule. And then thirdly, we had the post-monarchy, which is the ruin of Israel. Why in the world would God put all three of those divisions up there? First one is to help us with memorization and visualization as we read that. But I, I think there's something more pertinent to it that you need to understand. Listen as I wrote this down. They saw glory and failure. Heroism and disgrace. Renown and obscurity. And God was faithful through it all. No matter what the nation of Israel went through, the highs and the lows. How many of you have highs and lows in your, in your life? Don't you ever be tempted to think these are the only times that God's with you. He's with you down here too. That's the lie of the enemy. It says, oh yeah, this is, yeah, you, you were good then. God was really loving you, but he ain't loving you now. Baloney. That's Greek. Look it up. Do you know a truth I've told you before? God can never love you any more than he loves you right this very second. No more. But even better than that, he can't love you any less either. And he won't love you any less. So through all the highs and the lows and the in-betweens and the trials and the travails and the struggle and the strain of the nation of Israel, the lineage of Jesus Christ, the ancestry says, I was with you through it all. Now, how can we relate to that as, uh, to, to that as individuals today? Well, we have those periods of life for us as well. First, we were born with the purpose of ruling. Do you know when God created Adam in the garden, he said, you will have dominion over the earth. You will have dominion over the earth. Man was created to rule. By the way, when you, when you hear someone say you're lost, it's not geographically, okay? You're not lost like your car keys. You've lost because you lost what God created you for. You lost dominion. And what happened? We were born for that purpose to rule, right? But we lost it due to sin, right? And we became enslaved to sin. Notice what happened to Israel. They began to rule and then they were enslaved. <laughs> God never leaves his people enslaved. He sent a redeemer. He sent a redeemer. Now, the nation of Israel is going to have to wait a while. He's put them on a shelf. Their day is coming. Their day is coming when he's going to gather them back together. But I want to say in the meantime, in the meantime, God sent Jesus Christ, the Son, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, Jesus the Christ. And he said to all of us who have been enslaved by our own sin, look up. Your help has come. Listen. Jesus Christ. Matthew 1.1 1, 1, was born for you and me. He died for you and me. He rose for you and me. And he lives today. He lives today. So I want to ask you a few questions in closing. First, consider the, the preeminence of Jesus Christ. I want to ask you this question today, church. Is he preeminent in your life? Is Jesus Christ ruling and reigning in your life? Is he preeminent when people meet you and they, they're around you for a while? Do they know that Christ is central in your life? Secondly, are you aware of his providence? What does that word mean? His control, his sovereign power. I mentioned a while ago about our, our attitude of thankfulness. We're so unaware of what Christ is doing, God is doing in your life continually. 
it maddens me sometimes because, and I've been guilty of it, so if you've said this to me recently, I'm not just picking on you, but we say things like this. Well, so-and-so sick, or they got this, and, and now it's, you know, now only God can, can, that's how it was all along. The doctors have tried something, but now, n- n- look, if the doctors succeed, it's because God let them succeed. And if the doctors fail, it's because God has your days numbered and your time is now. That's, as, that's how it is. But we get so convinced of our own abilities that we go, well, now it's just up to God. It's always up to God. And if we realize that, we'd be so much more grateful for every day we breathe and we walk. Are you aware of his providence in your life today? Are you standing on his promises? Or just sitting on the premises? This is, this is sturdy. But his promises are more sturdy. What promises? Get in the word. Get in the word and find out. Are you standing on the promises today? And the last question I have for you this morning is, are you part of his family? That's what we've studied, 17 verses, the family of Jesus Christ. Are you part of that family? Only you can answer that question. You sit here this morning in one of two conditions. You're either part of the family of God or you're not. And the only thing that separates you is not your flaws It's simply trusting. Trust Him. How do I do that? How do I do that, preacher? What do I trust? You trust His work on Calvary, that He took your punishment. He took your death for you. He took all the wrath of God upon Himself that you might be free. That's it. Preacher, that don't make any sense to me. It don't make any sense to me either. Why would a perfect God take the whipping for me, an evil, wicked man? That's what he does. If i got to explain that, I'll just give up preaching because I can't explain it other than grace. It completely overwhelms my mind what God has done for us. The people in the ancestry, all flawed. We are too. Are you part of the family of God or not? My prayer for you this this day is that you will be part of his family. Just call out to him today. If you want to let me know, praise God. If you don't, that's fine. But I want to celebrate with you. We want to celebrate with you. Because it's possible for every single person sitting here today to be a part of the family of God. Can we learn anything from the ancestry of Christ? Certainly we can. Is there more to be extrapolated? Absolutely. Absolutely. In closing this morning, listen, I'm going to come down for one verse. If you want to come and share with me the victory uh, that Jesus has given you this morning, you come on. After our prayer, after I pray, I'm going to let summer go on back and begin to get ready. You come quickly if the Lord's spoken to you today. If you just need to come to the altar, You ignore me and you come and fall on your face before the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful today for your love and your mercy. Lord, I'm grateful that flawed people are part of your family. Lord, my prayer is that there might be one here this morning who wants to join your family. Father, there's no paperwork involved. There's no background check. You've already done that. Father, all we need to do is just surrender. Surrender. Lord, thank you for loving us. I pray that love is known by every person here today. Lord, for those of us who are your children, may we live a life that Christ is preeminent in. Lord, convict us today and change us. By Christ we pray. Amen. If you need to come, you come quickly.
We'll stand together and sing, Now I belong to Jesus, Jesus belongs to me, 503 in your hymn books. <laughs> 